Hello and welcome. I just had a great question sent in to me, so I thought I'd do another video on partial fractions. Now, remember that this process uh, is about taking a large fraction, maybe something like this, and breaking it into smaller fractions, and that these smaller guys are called our partial fractions. Now, in case you forgot this process or you've never seen it before, let's see uh, exactly how partial fractions work. The very first thing we want to do in, uh, say, taking a partial fraction decomposition is to look at the size of the polynomial on the top versus the size of the polynomial on the bottom. And we want the top one smaller. Uh, if you happen to have one that's actually larger in power on the bottom, you can run through the long division process to actually reduce it in power. From there, we want to end up completely factoring the bottom of our fraction. That will help us figure out the uh, new factors that we need to end up building into our new fractions. So once you get those factors, go ahead and start setting up your new fractions using those factors. I'm going to explain this step a little bit more because there are some criteria on how we build those new fractions. Now this will give us a lot of missing coefficients in the tops of each of those fractions. We'll solve for all of them and then we'll essentially have our partial fractions. So the problem we have today is this. 12x plus 52 all over x plus 2 squared uh, multiplied by x squared plus 3. So the very first thing I'm going to check in my process is to make sure the top polynomial is smaller than the bottom one. And what I can see is the top is uh, basically a, a first power, just a single x, whereas the bottom has a couple of x squared, so essentially x to the fourth on the bottom. So step one is looking good. My top polynomial is smaller than the bottom. Okay, now in step two, I want to completely factor the bottom. Now, this one's already been set up. The bottom is already completely factored. That means, essentially from here, I just have to work on setting up my new fractions. And we're going to set up our new fractions using these factors in our denominators. So let's look exactly how we do that. When building your fractions, you want to look at each of the factors uh, that you've broken down your original fraction into. Now, if one of those factors is raised to a power, you'll have a new fraction for each of those powers. So like in our problem, we have uh, uh, something squared, so I'll have a new fraction for the squared part and a new fraction for just a single power. Now, you can also split up your factors into two groups. They're either going to be linear or they're going to be an irreducible quadratic. If they are linear factors, they'll have a single constant on top, and if they're a quadratic factor that uh, you, know, you can't break down any farther, then you will have a linear expression on top. And fortunately, in the example, we have both of these, so you'll see uh, both of these uh, thrown into our partial fractions. So let's see how all of this throws uh, into our fraction and start making some new ones. Uh, here's some pieces that I want to identify. This guy right here is raised to a power of 2. So I'll have uh, one fraction to take care of the x plus 2 squared. And I'll have another fraction for just x plus 2. This is what I mean by you'll have a new fraction for each of those powers. Now, if this was like the third power, then I'd start off with x plus 2 to the third, then I go x plus 2 squared, and then I have an x plus 2. Whatever that power is, just keep counting down until you have a fraction for all of them. All right? We have another factor. This is x squared plus 3. Awesome. So I will essentially have three new factors for, or three new fractions for my partial fractions. Now let's see what two groups these fall into. If I look inside these parentheses, this guy is a linear factor. And even though it is being squared and, you know, being raised to a power, it's the guy inside parentheses that I'm really interested in. This one is also a linear factor, came from the same spot, and it's the one on the end that is actually the only irreducible quadratic. Now watch how this plays a part in building the uh, top pieces. So for the linear ones, I'll have a single constant on top. And since I don't know what that constant is right now, I'll just use a, a variable like a as a placeholder. Here I have another linear factor on the bottom. So another constant on top, possibly different from the first one, so I'll call this b. And for my quadratic term, it needs to be linear on top, so we'll use cx plus d. 
Now essentially you could call these missing coefficients anything you want, but it seems to be a convention to start off with A, go to B, C, D, all the way down the line. So just this setup here gives us an idea of what our partial fractions will look like, but uh, we're still missing what A, B, C, and D all are, and once we find those, then we'll actually know what that uh, partial fraction decomposition is. So to move on to the next step of this process, we need to solve for those missing coefficients. We need to figure out what they are. And in order to figure out what they are, we want to actually imagine what would happen if I took all of these partial fractions over here and started putting them back together. Well, in order for me to actually put these fractions together, I would need a common denominator. And so look at some of the missing pieces uh, in our original fraction versus some of these new fractions. Let's take this first one. If I had to combine this with everything else, it would need an additional x squared plus 3. So I'd end up putting that on the bottom and on the top. Now for now, I'm just going to write what the top of that first fraction would look like. So it would get multiplied by an additional uh, x squared plus 3. As I move on to the second fraction, fortunately it already has an x plus 2 in the bottom, but it would need another x plus 2 and an x squared plus 3. So you know those two pieces will get multiplied on the top and bottom. Let's put them in over here just so we can keep track of what's happening on the top. So it needs an extra x plus 2, and it needs an x squared plus 3. Awesome. On to the last fraction on the end. Uh, so this already has an x squared plus 3 piece on the bottom. It's missing the x plus 2 squared, so we'll give it that. So this will be cx plus d multiplied by x plus 2 squared. So the reason why I'm only keeping track of the tops is because I know that the bottoms of all of these will end up being exactly the same, and that will be exactly the same as the bottom over here. So in the end, we'll make a comparison among just the top pieces, and I, I'm not really putting in the bottom pieces because they'll end up gumming up my work quite a bit. So only focus on the tops for a moment, and let's end up uh, expanding this thing out. So as we go to expand this, we have to do lots of multiplying. We can distribute in this a, and get something like a x squared plus uh, 3 times a. Moving on to here, it looks like we can foil things together. So I have x times x, and x cubed outside, plus 3x inside, plus 2x squared, last terms, plus 6. Looks good. Alright, this one I got quite a bit of work to do. Before I even get to uh, multiplying the cx plus d, I'm going to foil this guy out on the end. x squared plus 4x plus 4. Awesome. Alright, let's continue uh, expanding things out, combining a few things together. And let's go ahead and factor in this uh, b value here. So let's see, uh, b x cubed plus 3 times b x plus 2 times b x squared plus 6 times b. Ooh, quite a bit. Alright? Now for these guys, I have to make sure that every term in here gets multiplied by every term over here. So we'll start with the cx and multiply it through. So cx times an x squared will be cx cubed. cx times the next term, 4cx squared. And cx times the 4 plus uh, 4cx. Okay, so this guy has been multiplied by everything onto d. d times x squared, dx squared, uh, d times 4x, 4dx, and d times 4, 4d. So you can see that in multiplying everything out, uh, you do get tons and tons of terms, but you know a lot of them are actually the same terms or, or like terms. What I'm saying here is that you have a few x cubes that you can start putting together, and you have a few x squareds that you can start putting together. Let's quickly go through and start highlighting some of our like terms. So in red, I've marked out both of our x cubes. Uh, I'll use blue for my squares. So 2b x squared, uh, 4xc, and dx squared. Okay, I got four of those guys. Let's see, our x's, 3bx, 4cx, uh, 4dx. 
awesome. Let's see, and I got an orange here for some of our linear guys. And what I'm doing here is that I'm looking to group things together so that I can make a better comparison down the road, okay? So let's start writing out all of our uh, cube terms, all of our squared terms. That way we can see everything we have. So starting with cubes, I have b x cubed plus c x cubed. That takes care of both of these guys. Okay, on to things that are squared. Plus a x squared, so there's that one. Now on to here, 2bx squared, 4cx squared, and looks like I have a dx squared. So 1, 2, 3, 4, got them all. Uh, on to our x's, plus 3bx, plus 4cx, plus 4 dx, and now just our constant guys, so plus 3a, plus 6b, and plus 4d. Awesome. So one more time I'm going to underline these things, that way if you're uh, looking back over this you can kind of keep track of everything that we've put together. So everything in red were our cubes, uh, everything with blue, those were our squareds, X's, I have the green, and of course the orange guys, those are just the constant terms. Now the reason why we're grouping these together is remember that all of this stuff essentially represents the top of all of these fractions when you put them together. And everything should be equal here, so the tops of all of these fractions put together should equal the top of this one. So now that we have our cubes, we're going to see how that matches up with our cubes in here. Now that we have our squared, see how it matches up with the squareds in there, and go all the way on down the line. Alright, let's get a new page. So I, I've started to factor things out. You can see that I factored out an x cubed from uh, everything that had an x cubed in it, an x squared from everything that had an x squared, and I'm just doing this to make the comparisons a bit easier. So here I have b plus c x cubed, and, and looking at the original top, there is nothing cubed. So what does this mean in the grand scheme of things? Well, it means that when you do add b and c together, you get zero, nothing. On to the next comparison. Here I have a plus 2b plus 4c plus d, and I'm looking at the original, and you know what? There's nothing squared in there. So when I add a plus 2b plus 4c plus d, all of these must, again, add to be zero. On to our extremely important uh, comparison over here. All of these terms are associated with an x, and I do have an x in the original. So as I put together a 3b, a 4c, and a 4d, all of these guys must equal 12, because this guy is associated with x, and all of these are associated with x. All right, one last comparison. All of these uh, constant terms on the end must be related to the only constant term in the original. So I know that 3a plus 6b plus 4d, all of that must equal our 52. So what we've just developed here is a system of equations involving our unknown coefficients on the tops of all of our partial fractions. Now when you get to this step and you've developed that system of equations, uh, you have lots of different options available to you uh, for solving that system of equations. Uh, in fact, check out some of my other videos on how to solve this using a matrix. You could also solve it, say, using a Gauss-Jordan elimination, or you can even possibly solve this uh, through a lot and lot of substitution. Uh, since that's not really the focus of this video, I'm just going to go ahead and skip to uh, what all of our coefficients end up being when you end up solving this system. Uh, so when I ended up solving this, I got a was equal to 4, 
B was equal to 4, C was equal to a negative 4, and D was equal to 4. Now if you're looking at all those going, great, I just discovered A, B, C, and D, what are they equal? Remember that these go all the way back to your original uh, missing coefficients on the top. Let's take a look. So we just discovered what A, B, C, and D need to be for our partial fractions. That means there's really only one step left of this. We'll go ahead and write out our uh, partial fractions uh, with these new coefficients on top. So our original, 12x plus 52 all over uh, x plus 2 squared x squared plus 3 according to our work we split this into three fractions x plus 2 squared plus x plus 2 plus x squared plus 3 and now we get to put in those coefficients on top. So A was equal to 4, there. B was equal to 4, that's on top of our second fraction. Here's what, here was our CX plus D. C was equal to a negative 4. And D was equal to a 4. Awesome. So what we have here then is our partial fraction decomposition. And these are all of the littler fractions that this main guy will break up into. Now, of course, this is a really important topic uh, when you get into calculus, uh, because these problems uh, tend to be easier to integrate than the original. All right, and now we're done. If you'd like to see some more videos, please visit MySecretMathTutor.com.